More than 6,000 journalists and news agencies have applied for accreditation to the Holy See Press Office for the Conclave. All of them are plugged into the headquarters of the Catholic Church, trying to understand what's happening inside. One of the people closest to the engine room is somewhat of an outsider himself, Greg Burke, an American journalist from St. Louis and now the senior communications advisor to the Vatican Secretary of State. I had a chance to speak to Greg next to the papal apartments. Greg Burke, thanks for joining us. It's not often that the Secretary of State or the Vatican in general brings in an outsider to do a specific job. Tell us, I mean, you're an American, you're a layman. What were you brought here to do? Oh, actually, uh, that does happen every once in a while on some of these specialist uh, diplomatic type things. So there are, there are some other laymen up here, also in the uh, historical department. But anyway, uh, I was brought in basically to try to help the flow of information from here, up here on the Secretary of State, on the Terza Loggia, um, down to the press office, basically, so that there's a better uh, coordination of information and a better, a better flow of information uh, with the press office. Now, you were appointed in what people see as the height of the Vatty Leaks controversy. Was your appointment a direct response to that particular crisis, or do you see it as um, an ongoing uh, improvement of public relations and communications generally? Yeah, I think it probably would have happened anyway, and that may have spurred it, made it happen a little quicker, okay? But uh, obviously there's been some talk about that. It wasn't a decision that was made uh, overnight, you know, anything related to that. Clearly, um, there have been some changes made in Vatican communications, more will be made, and this was sort of one important, uh, one important uh, position to be filled. You were a journalist um, or correspondent for Fox News before your position here. Um, how has your perception of the Vatican changed from the time you were an outsider to now being very much an insider? <laughs> Well, I know, where the, I know where the coffee machines are now, you know. Uh, the, no, to tell you the truth, it's like any job. You know, you see a company from the outside, and then you go work inside, and you say, oh, that, that's what it's really like. You know, you have one impression, and, and I think it's that. There have neither been uh, great surprises or great shocks uh, for the most part. Um, I'm, you know, I'm just quite impressed with the competence of the people who are up here, who have given their lives to work for the, for the Holy See. It's, it's very impressive. And uh, it's not something we hear a lot about, you know. The great, great majority of the people working for the Holy See are doing so very quietly, uh, very diligently, and very competently. Let's talk a little bit about the resignation of Pope Benedict. Where were you? How did you find out? Yeah. Um, the, I found out a little bit before it happened, sworn to secrecy. Later, I could tell that there were certain things that I had done that all fit into place. For, for example, an Italian woman had asked me, she said, Greg, I'd like to do some nice photo services on the Vatican, some things you don't normally see. And this was back in October or so, and I said, well, why don't we do the Convent of Contemplative Nuns? And she said, oh yeah, that'd be a great idea. And so I suggested it to my superiors, and they said, no, you know, it's the, the convent's being renovated right now. And so later I was able to understand that because I, I said, okay, fine, you know, and, uh, and there were a couple other things. I was supposed to be in vacation, on vacation in Los Angeles from the 1st to the 10th of February. And um, I had made a written request and went through the first layer. And then on the second layer, they said, why don't you try to come, by ba come back for the 6th through the 7th? I thought, oh, maybe we're going to have some news, but I was, I was thinking other news. I was thinking like the new head of the IOR, you know, what's known, not correctly, but known as the Vatican Bank. And I was thinking, well, maybe it's that. But I wasn't told immediately. And then uh, when I was told on uh, February 11th, I said, oh, this is why I was told to come back early. Hindsight is 2020, obviously. Sure. Um, what were those first few days like? Did you have a game plan or a strategy that you kicked into gear? When, when first, first few hours were crazy. The, the, the first two things I did, um, I came from Fox News where I did a lot of television, but I also did a lot of radio. The very first thing I did was buy a book for the Pope in German because I said, you know, he's finally gonna have time to read it. And in the back of my mind, I had had in the back of my mind, well, for Christmas, I'll get him a book, you know? And, but then that was literally the first thing I did. And I went on Amazon, 
My German is no good at all, but I figured out how to order the book and I ordered the book. And the next thing I did was I, I speaking of radio, I came up with a bunch of sound bites um, which I could send out at 12 o'clock once the news came out to, I had been doing this on other stories occasionally, but just some radio sound bites to try to describe the, the, the what happened and, and, and why it happened. I send those out to, to BBC and, and CNN and, and uh, all, the other, all the other networks which have radio, which have radio, Fox as well, which has radio, um, just to get that out so people would have, have English sound bites. And then I just waited for the phone to ring and it rang very quickly, people saying, is it true, is it true? And uh, of course it was. What was the mood or atmosphere like uh, specifically in your department and in the curial offices yeah, as a whole. inside it was very interesting. I mean, obviously in communications, we all knew a little bit beforehand, uh, but not everybody up here knew, which was interesting. I mean, because so there was, uh, you know, probably a lot of the same reaction just as when I got the word too. There was a lot of shock, but I had to admit, um, I didn't, hindsight is always great, but I did tell people, I said, you know, when he turned 85, I was at Fox and, that's always a typical thing. Pope turns 80, Pope turns 85, let's do a story, how's he doing? It's sort of, a, you know, it's not 83, but it's a 85. When he turned 85, we did a story for Fox, and I said, you know, his health's okay for an 85-year-old. He has these trips planned. Um, however, he could resign and hear the reasons. And uh, I had remembered the book, the book, uh, Light of the World, it, 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 you know, stood out when he, when he wrote it because I said, wow, okay. Um, and then someone else, I, I hadn't remembered that, but someone else had told me the, the thing about um, Celestine V, that, that Benedict had twice gone to pray at the tomb and one time even left his pallium there. So in hindsight, of course, it all, it all made sense. But I was sort of proud of the fact that we had done that story because it showed, it showed that we weren't just talking out of the top of our hats. There was, there was something there. Let's look at the, the big picture. Uh, for a moment and talk about the resignation in the big picture. Most people, when they look at the Catholic Church, see an institution that moves rather slowly. This was a, a shocking decision to all of us, almost all of us. What do you think some of the long-term effects of this decision of Pope Benedict are going to be on the Catholic Church, and specifically, you know, the, the Curia here, the, the governance of the Vatican here? Well, we're going to have to wait for the long term to really see. I mean, we're going to have to wait, um, you know, for the next two, three, four popes, see if anyone else resigns. Um, what, is, what is clear to me, I saw it as a very courageous and a, and a humble move. Uh, my dad's 90, and I thought a lot about my dad when I, when I, when I saw this, who obviously is retired, you know, but uh, slowing down and starting to feel his own his own. His own you know, human frailty. And uh, for the long term, we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but it's clear to me that, um, you know, this is something the church is going to have to deal with. I noticed it with, I followed all of John Paul's sickness, and the next story I did, I went to, I went to Israel, and uh, Ariel Sharon had a, had a, basically went into a coma. He had a stroke, went into a coma, and he's, he's been that way for six years. Um, People are living longer. You know, it's, it's a more complicated, it's a much more complicated scene. Obviously, John Paul II gave a great example of, of living through the illness. Uh, Pope Benedict, I think, you know, carried the cross as far as he could. I thought the timing was fascinating. You know, the Easter season saying, okay, I've, I've carried the cross up till now and, and this Holy Week, it will, it will be for somebody else. Um, but in terms of long-term, it's, it's speculation at this point. We have to see how the, how the next few popes handle it. You're an expert in communications. Let's talk about the media. We all know that the image that the media portrays of the Catholic Church is not always the best. What's the relationship like between the Holy See, the Vatican, and the press? Sixty-four thousand dollar question. I mean, that's a that's a uh, it's not a loaded question, but it's an open-ended question. Okay, because the press is is everything, uh, from the New York Times to anybody with an inter internet connection. That's what I tell people. I say I say, the great news about internet is that anybody who wants to be a Vaticanista can be a Vaticanista. 
living in Oklahoma if they're living there, but they follow the thing. I can go from there. And I said, that's great. And it's also the danger. Any, anybody can write what they want. What I have always pushed for people on, and I continue to do this, is okay, um, let's, let's push people to be professional. You know, let's push them to be professional and not uh, just copy something because it was in the paper um, or just say something because it seems to them like a, a nice theory. You know, no, maybe they can say it as that theory, but it's another thing to say, to have it, you know, at least grounded in something, if nothing else, history, you know, saying this is possible for this reason and that reason and that reason. And, and so, uh, you know, the short answer to your question is the relationship with the pe press depends a little bit on the press, and that runs the gamut of, of really nasty stuff. Um, to what you might call friendly stuff, and a lot of serious people in between who are neither friends nor enemies, but they're serious and they know what news is, um, and they at least adhere to certain standards, and, and that's a help. You know, we can live with that. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the conclave. Um, what's it been like uh, to try to navigate communications and public relations in this time when there are thousands and thousands of journalists, media, all eyes on Rome? Yeah, well, a conclave by its nature is gonna be a difficult uh, thing to cover because it, it is secret by its nature. Now, um, I saw also eight years ago that different people take the oath of secrecy in different ways. And that's unfortunate. I mean, I, I really, you know, the, the seriousness of the moment um, of a cardinal casting his vote and saying, in, in conscience, before God, I cast this vote for the person I deem to be most worthy. He's sort of talking about his eternal salvation, you know, if he's, if he's playing around with that in any way. But in, in, in terms of the press, um, clearly there's a fascination because it's, it's a, fascina a fascination, and I should say also, on the part of Catholics, a, it's a time of, of excitement and, and I would say hope because it's like, okay, who's gonna, who's gonna be our leader, you know? Who's gonna be our leader in the next, which goes way beyond any sort of political uh, thrill, you know, about, okay, my candidate won, but this, this isn't my candidate. It's who's, who's going to be the vicar of Christ uh, on earth. Now, there are, that excitement also comes through in the press and you see it with the people who, who come here. Um, but the nature of the conclave does make it a little complicated. I, I think Father Lombardi's done a great job with the help of Father Rosica, the fact that they brought in English and, and French and Spanish as well, certainly. I see it because I see it, the, the effects on television. Um, and, and clearly though, um, it's, it's, a, it's a delicate balance, you know, it's a delicate balance because the Cardinals have to feel free to be able to speak uh, and yet at the same time, until they really go in to start voting, uh, it's impossible you know, to say, no, 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 everything's closed and there's nothing you can say. At least you get the general, the general things that are coming out. I think you know, we, can, we can live with that and, and, and journalists can live with that as well. Let's, I wanna talk a little bit more about that because it's this, there's this balance that you need to maintain, like you said. There's a great need obviously to tell the story. I mean, this is, we've talked many times about how this is an evangelizing moment, a teaching moment, right? But, you know, the, the, that's not only the Vatican's job. Every cardinal can do that. And I always, I always say, you know, that's what we, we were telling people on Twitter. Well, is there gonna be back and forth? You know, is the Pope gonna be, is gonna, gonna do the back and forth and respond to some of these people who write to him? I said, you know, Pope's really got other things to do, but the church is, the church is also a local church. You know, and, and there are many people out there communicating. And I think, I think the same thing is true with the, with the conclave. You know, they, while they do it, did ask the cardinals after a couple of days to, to drop the interviews, uh, they still go out and preach. Some were still doing their radio shows. Some were still tweeting. Um, you know, and you're right. It is an evangelizing moment. I mean, I was impressed that people, the number of people saying, hey, pray for us. We're about to go into the conclave, you know. And, and let's not forget that in the, in the midst of the excitement and the conclave and the secrecy and who's going to be the next pope, uh, people seem to forget, hey, this is really 
it's an evangelizing moment, but it's also a moment of prayer. It's, it's a moment for the entire church to unite in prayer uh, for the cardinals and for the next pope. One last question. Let's talk about the future of the Catholic Church. From your perspective, which is communications perspective, PR perspective, what are the characteristics that are needed in a pope in 2013, given the challenges, given the challenges of communication media today? Well, the pope is not uh, a political leader as such, and I don't think we have to, I don't think we should think of him as that primarily as, oh, we need a good <laughs> somebody, a, a, a politician who speaks in sound bites, okay? I'll be very happy, Pope who appreciates a good soundbite and, and, and gets it out, but that's not the key thing. The key thing is uh, the message of Jesus Christ that this person, this person represents for us. And, and that's why a lot of people don't get it. Cardinal Dolan was asking me, how do I get these people away from sort of the idea of just seeing the church as one more organization? And I said, well, hit him in the head first and then, and then take it from there. But um, no, I mean, it, it, you know, if you don't see the supernatural sense, if you don't see uh, the Vicar of Christ here, what, you know, we don't, we don't, as Catholics, don't love the Pope because he's charismatic and glib and, and, and has a great presence. That all helps. That all helps, but um, we do it because of, of who it is. You are Peter. You know, you're Peter with all his weaknesses and, 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 and uh, but you know, you are the rock on which I will build my church. And so, I mean, I, I joked with somebody saying I'd, I'd, I would really be happy to see a Pope who every once in a while did a news conference. And I'm sure that shocks people because it makes it look much too much like any prime minister uh, or president. On the other hand, I I think that's great. I think uh, not only do I not think there's anything wrong with it, I think there's some very good things about it, and it also is a, a, a moment to evangelize. I want to thank you for taking a, a substantial amount of time out of your busy schedule to speak with us. I thank really, you. I really appreciate it.